the very pay out. Why does everyone like hit points? Why? Because they're the life of the party. <laughs> it's hyper compelled duel. Everybody, <laughs> welcome to Compelled Duel. I'm sorry, the joke was really good. I'm a dumb piece of shit. <laughs> I'm Al and I'm Barry, <laughs> and we are an actual play D and D podcast. And that we can now say we are co DM'd single player. So this is going to be a little bit different from our first episode where we were kind of switching off DMs. The rest of the campaign we are going to be doing essentially two separate campaigns that is each DM'd by one of us and played by the other. And there might be, like, some crossover, we're not totally yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So you might see, like, moments of episodes that are a little bit like what you saw in the last episode, yeah. where we were just, like, randomly switching in the middle of the narration, but that's not going to be the constant from now on, because yeah. our characters, Leorella and Ferrara, are both in very different places now than they were in the first episode. Yeah. <laughs> and we will probably have titled this when you're listening to it to reflect this, but this is a Leo episode. Oh boy. <laughs> So we will be sticking with Leo through the narration the whole time. I'm so sorry. Yeah, it's fine. It's going to be great. All right. Let's yeah. get this show on the road, shall we? All right. And we enter in on the large nation uh, known as the Sovereign Principalities of Tordun. As is implied by the name, Tordun is essentially nine city-states with associated territories around them, kind of vaguely assembled under a unified banner against, like, foreign intrusion. But the political situation is, as Leo has found out in the last, what, we said five years, the situation politically is a little rocky. The kings of the separate principalities don't necessarily like each other much, but they get together about once a month to discuss matters that affect all of them. Leo has been living in the court of Bertrand Silvertree in the city-state of Irie. Bertrand is a indulgent, we'll say, old human man. Genuinely, he's like 70 years old. <laughs> okay. And he thinks Leo's really pretty. So I yeah. ran away from my stolen birthright and became a sugar baby for five years, is what you're telling me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's in character. <laughs> yeah, Leo yeah. is kind of the embodiment of that Brendan Yuri quote, the I'll be a pretty boy for money. I'm assuming that was kind of his angle. He got across the water from Assyria and got further inland, and I mean, basically he had nothing, so he... Being accustomed to the finer things as he is, I mean, I, I'm sure he would go looking for some indulgent noble that was willing to house him and take care of him while he pitches this whole overthrowing his father thing. The ferry from Asheria to the mainland leads through the forests of the sparsely populated nation of Darir. The river that the ferry enters in on hits straight into the sea that makes up most of the western border of Tordun. Irie is the first nation you hit when okay. you get there. And Leo's been there for all five years? I would assume, unless you think he would have been tramping out through the wilderness. The city-states are loosely aligned, and they have associated territories around the grand walls that separate them from the outside world, but a lot of the land in Tordun is mostly not uninhabited, but unregulated. There's a lot of mercenaries, there's a lot of bandits, there's a lot of general violence and mischief. <laughs> so it's like Mad Max, you know, in between these... Yeah, not basically. quite that bad, but yeah, it's pretty okay, much... Okay, cool, I've shacked up with Immortanjo for five years, I guess, <laughs> it's fine. That tracks for me that Leo would yeah. have done something. I mean, he would have been so scattered coming out of the situation as quickly yeah. and the way that he did. He literally pretty much left Australia with the clothes on his back. He doesn't have exactly. a lot of options. He's kind of got to find a bigger fish to swim behind. And I would think it would take a few years to really endear yourself on the level that I think you would be comfortable with to this old man. <laughs> Leo wants political power, so to get political power in this situation, I think he would have had to have been there for a while and been like, 
pretty tight with the king. I want to make it clear there is nothing untoward. Oh happening. yes, oh yes. Yeah. Like <laughs> Leo is perfectly content yes. to be to sit there and be pretty exactly. and therefore be exactly. taken care of. Like he will go on this old old man's arm to like social functions. And exactly. Things. It stops there. <laughs> this has not stopped rumors, but Yeah, oh yeah, no. I'm yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, of course. Speaking up. You have been invited to one of the monthly councils of the separate kings of the principalities of Tordion. There are nine of them, and they sort of rotate where they meet. This month they are meeting in Irie, and there has been just general discussion about the state of things. And now the king of Estermuth, uh, one Mr. Isaac Ashthorn, another human king, very like tall, regal, solidly built dude brown skin, long curly hair, with a huge great sword strapped to his hip that is bound into its sheath with leather cords. Like, tied into it? Yes. Oh. yes. So if he wants to draw it, he has to purposefully untie it. Okay. Yeah. Sick. He stands before the council, and he says, My friends, I implore you to... Think hard about the issues that King Silvertree has planned to present to the rest of us. I implore you to think of the situation that we recently fought our way out of, the conflict between our nations that I know several people in this room decimated your families and the people that you hold close. It is close to my own heart, being how I acquired my throne, as you all know, and how my late wife was unfortunately taken from us, and the rest of the council kind of winces. I implore you to remember the context that we come from and the proud spirit of our culture before you think about any issues that King Silvertree is going to present to us. And with that, I yield the floor to you, gentlemen, and of course, Euphemia. And he kind of like puts up a hand defensively. And the one woman on the council, this, like, old halfling lady, he raises one eyebrow at him. <laughs> and you know this to be Queen Euphemia Iron Splitter. She is the queen of Drenbridge. She is extremely intimidating. She's just a buff, older halfling lady. She is unmarried and has been fighting the council for, like, two of the years that you've been here. To let her appoint her niece as her heir. The other kings, of course, are Merrick Frost Whisper of Floria, who is a younger than Isaac, but not young by any means, goblin man. He is generally soft-spoken, but very principled. There is Warren Donchaser of Lockham. Uh, he's ten. <laughs> uh, okay. He's ten, and his mom comes with him to these council meetings. Aww. Because she actually knows what's going on politically, but she is not the queen. Aw, little buddy. He's half-halfling. His mom is human. His dad was a halfling. Okay. So he's just a very small 10-year-old in very elaborate robes who little, just kind of... yeah, fancy boy. Yeah, he just kind of sits there and kicks his feet. <laughs> um, he likes you because you seem fun, but his political opinions are not super developed. Warren, you know, took the throne at, like, age three. There was a civil war in Tordoon shortly before you got here. They were, like, reconstructing from it when you landed. And Warren's father, who was the previous King Don Chaser, was a war hero who was cut down in one of the final battles of the war. Impressive dude who you know almost nothing about because his ten-year-old son is on the throne. <laughs> there is Lubash Thunderbow, who is the King of Isenhall. He is a large Orcish man, a proud Orcish man, slicked-backed, braided hair, big old tusks, bright black and yellow eyes. <laughs> he is... Sick as fuck. And I had to end up with fucking Gandalf. Cool. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. There is Bobbin Rosebrook, the King of Stoutwood, who is another halfling. Very mild-mannered, much like King Crosswhisper. They are both sort of just hanging back for a lot of the council meetings. Neither of them have openly supported you, but neither of them have openly condemned you. There is Jasper Shadestone, King of Sewell, who... Does not like politics at all. He's just this little goblin man. He clearly didn't intend on taking the throne. He's kind of stuck with it now until one of his kids or one of his nieces and nephews gets to an age that they can take it. He doesn't like you. Who yeah. does? I, yeah. yeah. Who does? As someone who did not expect to take a throne and is now stuck with one, he does not like the idea of you at all. 
And then there's Fing, Night Peak King of Tosmery, who is a big half-orc dude. He thinks you're interesting. He's more a scholar than a king, really. You get the impression from the years that you spent around this council that many of them are either very old or were not prepared for the role that they're in now. So it's all kind of a mess. And then Isaac, of course, hates your guts. He has not been subtle about it. He does not like any of what you are bringing to the table. Who does? Who does? Yeah, who does yeah. like me? It's this fine. creepy old man is who likes me. It's fine. <laughs> this has been my life for five years. This is fine. Yeah. Bertrand thinks you're great. <laughs> oh, gross. <laughs> Bertrand thinks your magic is awesome. He thinks you're pretty. Bertrand thinks you're the fucking bee's knees. How have I been developing my magic if I've been isolated for five years from there aren't any churches of Kimral, which is sort of something you've noticed, because that is the main religious order of Asheria, and it's just not, there's no trace of it here, okay. which I think has been kind of an adjustment, and also a bit of an impediment to your clerical development. I don't think it's developed over much since you left. I think you've been doing, like, parlor tricks and secretly kind of working at it. I think you've gone up to, like, cleric level three. There has not been much opportunity to really flex your skills. What's the situation at this council meeting? Is there, like, a table? Like, am I at the table equal with everybody? Am I back a little bit? There is a large, raised, circular platform around which all the kings are sitting, and they can all go down to the middle of the floor to speak. And then behind them, on big circular risers, is everyone who is sitting in on the meeting. So the family of most of the kings, any important courtiers that they are showing favor to by letting them sit in, I think because of the positioning of the cities, you are sitting near the envoy from Estermuth. A couple courtiers, old, old scholars that are there to advise the king, and of course the princess of Estermuth, Eleanor Ashthorn, who has been kind of shooting glances at you through this meeting. What kind of glances? Roll me an insight check. <laughs> well, I rolled a three, so... But with, with my plus six to insight, that's a big fat nine. Hard to interpret. She's hard to read. She has not been very interested in you before, but I think because Bertrand has said he is going to bring the issue to the table in this meeting, the whole issue of you trying to gather forces and gather power, I think she is a little more interested because she knows there is a confrontation coming. I'm not in a position where I can speak, right? Like, I'm just having to hang back and listen. You cannot speak unless you are called to the floor. It's kind of like a courtroom. Like, okay. if you are called to the well, you can speak. Until then, you are advised to remain silent. To sit down and shut up. Okay. Yeah. That's not really Leo's MO, but he's politically savvy yeah. enough that he's gonna, you know, when in Rome, he's just gonna kind of yeah. hang back and yeah. see what happens. As King Ashthorn goes to sit back in his seat, King Bertrand laboriously gets to his feet and goes down the steps into the well and makes a broad gesture at the council and says, My fellows, I would put before you this day that we have nothing to lose and everything to gain by supporting the rightful ruler of a sovereign nation that has been reluctant to ally and to trade with ourselves in the past. I would put before you that if there is a crisis of succession in another land, then that may inspire crises of succession in our own, given that our structure of the transference of power is similar. I would put before you all that we need to be gathering closer ties between other nations, given intrusions on our northern border from the nation of Agvaldor, and that... There is no harm to be gained in throwing a bit of influence, of which we have much to spare, behind a rightful king. And then he kind of dips half a bow, and then I will, of course, take input from my fellows. And then, under his breath, <laughs> King Jasper Shadestone says, so what he's saying is his boy toy was being very impressive today. <laughs> Ooh! <laughs> and there are a couple oohs from the seats around the table. I have not been invited to speak. I yeah. <laughs> am pressing my lips into a very thin line and just, like, looking at this guy and yeah. nodding, like, okay, you're first. 
You're first. You I just co- went to the top of the list. <laughs> Above my father. Yeah. You just went to the top of the list. Yeah. A couple people that are in the seats with you kind of snort, <laughs> including Eleanor or Ashthorn. I glare at her. She, like, raises an eyebrow at you <laughs> and then motions to look back towards the table. Warren Dawn Chaser turns to his mother and says, What's a boy toy? <laughs> and his mother says, We will talk about it later. Ed kind of pats his head. <laughs> And then glares viciously at King Shadestone, who raises his hands like, what can you do? Euphemia Iron Splitter taps the table to indicate that she wants to speak on the record, and then says, personally, I hear a lot of talk about the rightful, what is the title? Uh, uh, I, I haven't been invited to speak. I'm yeah, not going to say she, anything. She is going to turn in her seat and kind of like gesture at Leo and say, say the title for the record. I can't keep track of it. If it please the council, I would inform you all that the political structure of Australia is decided by the divine right of kings. So uh, according to our priesthood, who invests the current leaders of Australia with power, the king of the country is our nation's sovereign god, Kimrel, And the mortal folk who serve in his wake are known as the Archduke. So as such, rather than being the king, my father is the Archduke of Australia, and rather than being the prince, I am the Grand Duke of Australia. Yes. Lovely. She turns back to the table and says, I've heard quite a lot about who is the rightful, and then she half turns and makes a acquiescing gesture and says, Archduke of our neighbors, I would put before the council that there is currently on the throne of Australia an Archduke, and that I personally, do not seek to incur the wrath of a foreign nation when we are already facing invasions on one of our borders. As she says that, Bob and Rosebrook taps the table and raises a hand and says, uh, should we not hear from the young man himself? Would he be comfortable? Uh, and then he, like, looks out. As before he's yeah. done saying, would he be comfortable? <laughs> Leo is up and down in oh, the middle God. of that circle. <laughs> By the way, he is wearing Splendid, I'm sure, provided by his generous host, <laughs> yes. sheer elven yeah. robes, with a slit clear up to the thigh. I would like, before I open my mouth, mm-hmm. to roll a couple checks. Yes. I am going to have to do so much bullshitting <laughs> right now, and yeah. I need to know how well I can do it. Sure. Um, I would like to roll a history check to kind of get more insight on the interactions between these people and kind of their feelings towards me because of it. And I would also like to roll an insight check to see who the easiest people to convince are going to be. Okay. Because Leo's not, he's got this one chance to kind of pull people over to his side. He's not going to waste time on non-starters. Yes. Okay. Okay. So the history check to see if I can get any kind of knowledge of the history of everything going on here. Okay. Um, and I would also love to hear about the history, well, with a seven. Leo's not been paying a lot of attention, no, he huh? really hasn't. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, he's been taken care of and provided everything he wanted. What, why would he need of to Of course. Oh, man. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I probably don't know anything about the context of, of the history yeah. that is being talked about other than that there was a war. Okay, so I'd like to do an insight check to kind yes. of, like, cast a wide net and just see Absolutely. who's going to be the easiest kind of people to sway over in my cause. Okay. Oh, okay, Ooh. that was much better. A 22 to insight okay. to see who I'm going to be able to get on my side the easiest. Bertrand is already on your side. Duh. Uh, <laughs> Look at this ass, of course he is. Lubash Thunderbow is pretty into the idea of backing you. He does not really care if there is another conflict going on with Asheria. He is very concerned with the fact that you have been cut out of the succession. Like, what Bertrand said about having a crisis of succession really rattled him. You understand that's a sore spot from, like, the face that he made when that sentence came up. You think Bobbin and Merrick and Warren could all be easily convinced to support you. Warren, because he's a kid and he thinks you're cool, he would be very easily... I can do cool magic tricks. He's not really politically savvy. He doesn't really care about the far-reaching consequences. He thinks, okay, we will support this cool guy. 
Bobbin and Merrick don't seem to have firm stances on a lot of things. They go with the flow a lot. And you sense that their loyalties are to their cities first and to the grand scheme of things second. And they could be pretty easily convinced if you got other people on your side. Isaac is a non-starter. Euphemia would need it to be way more of a sure thing that they would not face retribution. And Jasper and Fang don't like you. Jasper does not like the fact that you want the throne, and Fang just kind of thinks you're obnoxious. Well, and that's his and right. And that happens. Yeah, yeah, that's his right. <laughs> yeah. But um, he's entitled to his correct opinion. Yes. <laughs> Alright, let me check some stuff on my character sheet, because I have a feeling that I'm going to have to give the best bullshitting of my life <laughs> to get what I want out yeah. of this. So just... Give them the old razzle-dazzle, razzle-dazzle Okay, here we go. Leo descends down the stairs into the center of this medieval conversation pit, I guess yeah. you could call it. Esteemed sovereigns of the principalities of Tordun, I come before you today to present perhaps an alternative opinion to many of the assumptions you may have made about me. And he uh, glares at the guy that called him a boy toy <laughs> really pointedly. Pink Shade Stone says nothing. <laughs> okay. I think that because I have been so generously hosted in the city of Irie, of course, but isolated from your people and your culture, and I certainly am a strange appearance in your lands, I understand this, but I think we are all underestimating exactly what it is I am bringing to the table here. First of all, a crisis of succession, given the tumultuous history of your nation, would be bad for everyone, even on foreign shores. I know for a fact that you are all a proud people who put great stock in your leadership, and one would assume that none of you would want to see somebody with a rightful claim to a throne, even a foreign one, denied his birthright. Of, but of course I can't speak for all of you, and I glare at the other people that don't like me. <laughs> Bertrand elbows you as you do that. <laughs> Just one bony elbow right in the ribs. Because <laughs> um, he has not left the well. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just hike my robes up a little higher. Uh, God. <laughs> Gross. I'll be a pretty boy for money. Listen. <laughs> also, I think that we are critically understating the mutual benefit that could befall all of us with all of your agreement to provide me the military resources to travel back to Australia and reclaim my birthright. I know for a fact that your lands are very rich in material resources, the gemstones, the agriculture, the fishing, the forestry, we could open up trade routes into Australia that are previously unexplored because of the insularity that my father's line has imposed on our country. Australia is also rich in many of our own resources. Our country is known for its artisans, its architects, and of course, there is a potential for trade in, and then uh, I would like to cast Thaumaturgy. Mm-hmm. No, actually, I'd like to cast, like, can I do, like, a controlled sacred flame to where I'm just, like, holding fire in my hand? Yeah, sure. Okay, um, I would like to do that, and then... I think as you do it, it is this deep blue silver fire, mm -hmm. as opposed to regular, given the source of your power and also okay. your own palette. Okay, so yeah, I pull up the sacred flame and I hold it in my hand, and then I would also like to cast Thaumaturgy and cycle the flame through a couple different colors Ooh, as I walk okay. around the circle, like, showing it to everybody. Uh-huh. Australia has the potential to be great exporters of arcane knowledge, especially in the field of clerical magic, which I haven't seen too much of since I've arrived in your lands. We have the potential to be very productive friends, and it goes without saying that your territory scuffles with Vogvaldor to the north are a shared historical struggle with Australia, and we would be more than happy, under my rule, to provide Australian naval support, very strong Australian naval support for the record, to the western border of Vogvaldor to help you put down these border scuffles. I rest my case, and he <laughs> sucks the sacred flame back up into his hand. Roll and persuasion with advantage. With advantage, okay. <laughs> I've got good persuasion because I have a noble background. Yeah. <laughs> Roll with advantage. Come on. 
14. Okay. 14. All right. You see a couple nods around the circle. Bob and Rosebrook, who has not been enthusiastic about anything as long as you've been here, seems enthusiastic about what you're saying. He's nodding really hard. There are a few more subdued reactions. You see Thing Nightpeak's posture kind of loosens a little bit. And Jasper Shadestone still looks like he's not into you, but you caught him nodding, like, once <laughs> during that speech. I don't need him to like me, I just need yeah. him to me. And Euphemia Ironsplitter, who, she has very little reaction to what you said, but she does steeple her fingers in front of her, and she says, We will ask that our various councils leave the room as we deliberate further and elaborate upon the results of our discussion today at such time as we have gotten to any results as far as our decision, whether that be that we will need to think on it further or a more definitive choice. Um, I have a question. I am willing to roll a check for it if I need yes. to do like, an insider history. Um, yes. I'd like to know, A, like, what Leo is asking these people for. Okay. Um, and that could be a collaborative decision between you and me. And I would like to know what the stakes of today are. Like, am, am I at risk of getting kicked out, essentially? Okay. Um, the, to answer that second one, first of all, absolutely not. Okay. They have no jurisdiction on each other's sort of decisions within their walls. Okay, so, like, yeah. the sovereignty of this king that is happening yes, exactly. with him, like, yeah. will be respected no matter what. Yeah. The other... Rulers have no power within the walls of Irie. They can't do anything about any laws that Bertrand institutes or anyone that he chooses to accept in. They can do something about him choosing to send forces out, which I think has been the main thing that you've been looking for, is political power and uh, manpower. So it's sovereignty within the walls of the city, but collaborative sovereignty outside the walls, essentially. Yes, exactly. Okay. He is essentially trying to raise an army. Like, yeah. Right now, his plan for the last five years has essentially been acquire more magic, acquire yeah. military might, go back to Australia guns blazing. So I, I think he's just basically asking for like yeah. full military support that is not otherwise yeah. spoken for in the border yeah. conflict or in just like security yeah. of the city states. And I think that has been what Bertrand presented is that he is very willing to throw his military power behind you. He is not the most militarily powerful of the council, and he has no jurisdiction to send his military anywhere without support of the rest of the council. So you are trying to win them over enough that, first of all, they will send their own men, and second of all, that they will let the guy that has been sponsoring you send his. Okay. I assume I'm being sent out of the room by yeah, saying like, everyone's being sent. Everyone except Warren Don Chaser's mother is being sent out of the room. Okay. Is there any way for me to like get down with King Bertrand and like ask how I did? Because uh, I feel he's already in the well. Yeah, you can talk to him. Yeah, I'm just kind of leaving. I think just kind of under my breath, I'm gonna like lean over. How did I do? He leans over and he says, "Honestly, I haven't seen Euphemia that receptive to a pitch in 15 years." What can I say? The Australian Razzle Dazzle has a proud <laughs> lineage. And he, like, claps you on the back and says, Watch out for Estremeth daggers, though. I've had a knife poised over my back my entire life, Your Majesty. I think I'll be just fine. Yeah. And uh, Leo <laughs> is going to turn around and go. Speaking of Estremeth daggers... Uh-oh. There is a larger hall outside of the council chamber, and as you walk out into it... Eleanor Ashthorn gleefully bounces over to you. <laughs> uh. Well, I mean, is it uh is she an uh person? She you haven't had a lot of discussion with her. She has seemed to go along with her father's opinion that you are a con man at best. She's I mean not she's not totally wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. She has been largely uninterested, first of all, because like the politics isn't really her purview yet, and second of all, because she doesn't think that you're a real threat or anything. As I said earlier, she has been interested today, because today is when your case got presented. Yeah, I mean, like, how much interaction have I had with her? Probably not a lot. Maybe a few conversations. I've been here for five years, but, like, she is the princess of another city that you don't go to. If she comes bouncing over, I'm just going to give a very polite bow. Princess Ashthorn. Grand Duke Valsine. 
She is a 4'10 half-goblin girl. She looks a lot like her father. She has similar brown skin, straight nose, curly hair, but her skin has this overlay of like mottled gray-green over it, and she has big luminous yellow eyes, frilled ears, and sharp teeth. She is very obviously of goblin heritage, but she looks a lot like her human father. (laughs) And she has bladed like the Xena chakram. (laughs) Fuck yeah. (laughs) On her wrists. Yeah, she has this mischievous smile on her face and she leans in conspiratorially and she says, I don't think you should wait around for this deliberation. What's that supposed to mean? It means that notoriously the Council of Tordun is slow to make a decision on anything. (laughs) If we needed council approval to bake bread, all of our cities would starve. Sounds close enough to Australian politics that I'm perfectly patient. You may be patient, but I wonder if the situation is. Now, if it were me, and she puts a hand over her chest and bats her eyelashes a little, I would keep in mind that the council speaks with one voice. The common people have plenty of their own. So what, you suggest that I go out into the city and rabble-rouse and try to build myself an army of peasants with pitchforks and torches? From the way that you say go out into the city, I'm sensing that you haven't done that much since you've been here, which has been how long exactly? Five years, but due to King Silvertree's generous hospitality, I have (laughs) wanted for nothing. I've had no reason to go down and seek out anything for myself. I've been immaculately taken care of. The hospitality of your people in these lands is legendary. King Silvertree is an old fuddy-duddy that wouldn't know the will of the people if it bit him in the ass. I have spent my fair share of time in Irie, as I have in all the cities, and I could show you a few interesting places. Why? She smiles a little bit and she says, I am of the opinion. Contrary to my father's wisdom, though I do believe him to be a very wise man, that the occasional conflict is not as antithetical to our way of life as he believes. I believe that for any change to occur, there must be some level of conflict, and I do believe that things desperately need changing here and, I would assume, in your home. You assume correctly. That mischievous little smile widens into this big, toothy grin. And she says, I will, hopefully not for quite some time, but eventually take the throne of Estimuth. And at that time, I find it beneficial to make allies rather than stick to my principles. So are you saying that any kind of interaction with me is against your principles, then? Most undoubtedly, sir. If I had a gold piece for every time I've heard that, I wouldn't have to worry about raising an army. (laughs) Carry on. I would love to uh, see the city through your eyes. I have a question. Would it be a faux pas for me to go change out of my um, (laughs) courtesan's garb (laughs) and uh, maybe put on some armor before I go out into the urban (laughs) setting? It kind of depends. She hasn't said how far into the city she's taking you. Uh, I think I'm just yeah. going to ask, like, am I dressed appropriately for where you're thinking of taking me? Please don't set me up for failure. I, I do have to suspect this, but I am going to take you at your word <laughs> this one time. And just do know if you do screw me over, it's it's done. It's done. Never again. <laughs> she blinks innocently and she's very hard. Hard to see as a threat, given that she is a 4'10 half-goblin girl. Hey, I'm 5'2", and I'm a fucking force of nature. She's very small and very cute. You would bet she banks on not being taken as a serious threat often. Yeah, I'm not gonna make that mistake. She flutters her eyelashes a little bit and says, Now, are you implying that I would lead you into a trap, Duke Valsheim? I am asserting that if you had free reign to put a knife in my back right now, I would undoubtedly be looking at it coming out between my ribs, princess. She seems 
just delighted by the fact that you said that. <laughs> um, and she says, I do not plan for us to end up in a situation where you will need to be dressed. Well, I do think you should take that off. I would uh, highly recommend that you not go out looking like the king's personal, how do I say this, arm candy. You'd be surprised at how well being arm candy pays, but all right, I can go get a change of clothes. I'll meet you in the Great Hall. Absolutely. Um, okay. And she, like, bounces away. The armor I have is a breastplate. Well, yeah. Uh, and I mean, like, is this a setting where, like, people that are of the class that they have weapons kind of just carry them with them? Because, I mean, like, I know you said Eleonora had, like, chakra yeah, on her. Yeah, like, Eleonora yeah. is pretty obviously armed. Um, her father, though, has his, the sword. Yeah, yeah, the sword is bound up, but he carries it everywhere. Okay. So, like, yeah, you could take weapons places. Okay, I just, I don't want to be perceived as, like, a threat. Leo is playing it very cool, but also he is very cautious of this situation. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I think he assumes baseline that she is setting him up somehow. Maybe not okay. necessarily to, like, take him in a back alley and kill him, but yeah. to do something to, like, damage his reputation. Yeah, he would not have any reason to believe otherwise. If your instinct is to take a weapon, take a weapon... Uh, yeah, I'm yeah. gonna go back up to wherever my quarters are, uh, yeah. change out of my yeah. council outfit, just put on my typical robes and the breastplate, and take my shield and my longsword and my holy symbol with me. Leo has his holy symbol on, it's on a choker around yes. his neck, and he just kind of casts, like, from the amulet. I was gonna run this by you, I think it would be really cool if the uh, chain of office that he sacrificed in the yeah. last episode turned into a holy symbol. Ooh, I do like that, yeah. Partially melted around the edges. Absolutely. Yeah, so he's got that, like, mounted on the choker around his neck. Now. Yeah. But, um, yeah, he's gonna change into the breastplate and, like, the usual robes and get a sword and a shield and then go back down and meet her. Eleanor has put on a dark cloak and she still has the chakra on, but she has put on a jacket under the cloak so she has sleeves covering okay. most of it. She looks... Subtle. <laughs> she looks like she could pass through a crowd pretty unnoticed. Okay. I mean, yeah. well, like, uh, Leo's an Australian elf. Like, he's gonna... Yeah, he's gonna... Un unless he's got, like, hood up. Yeah, so he's probably yeah. gonna turn heads no matter what, and in fact, he likes it that way. Yeah, Eleanor kind of looks you up and down and goes, well, I suppose that'll do. And then makes a gesture and just starts heading out the castle. I follow her. I am keeping yeah. my head on a fucking swivel, though. I will take this yeah. moment to remind you that Leo's passive perception <laughs> is 16. If she's going to stab him in the back, she's got to beat a 16 she's walking to do in it. front of you. I don't put it past her. That's right, that's right. I don't trust her. She leads you past any of the areas you've been to. Leo has mostly spent time in, if at all, out throughout the city, he has spent time in the aristocratic areas. She kind of leads you past that into, like, the merchant sector, and she slides into a bar, making a gesture for you to follow. Oh, okay, I can get down with this, Leo yeah. says to himself. And yeah. <laughs> Leo pro oh my god, Leo probably hasn't been to a bar in five years. This sucks. <laughs> this actually rocks for him. Yeah. <laughs> we heard a lot about Leo's behavior in the last session. Leo was a little bit of a black sheep before mm -hmm. he got uh, booted out of Australia. He was definitely known for carousing and uh, <laughs> causing a little bit of a hullabaloo. Like, think of, like, Princess Tia Beanie from Disenchanted. That was, oh, man. Yeah, <laughs> that, it, that's kind of the vibe that Leo had as yeah. uh, Grand Duke before he lost his position. So the fact that he hasn't been to a bar in five years and is getting the opportunity to go to one right now is great for him. It's kind of dingy. It's not what you're used to. It's a very obviously, like, merchant bar. <laughs> I would assume Leo has mostly been to the places that an Asturian noble would frequent. Yes. And this is not that kind of high-class establishment. It's 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 a dive bar. Okay. Yeah, it's all right, but it's... Hey, is there, yeah. is there <laughs> wine? Like, is there wine? Is there liquor? That's fine. The wine probably wouldn't be too good, but they do have a shelf of liquor behind the bar. <laughs> Barkeep! The bartender looks at you like, why did you say it that way? <laughs> Something off the top shelf, please, and I slide some gold across the bar. Like, more than enough gold to pay for it, and a nice tip. He kind of, like, shrugs, nods, takes the gold, uh, gets a a bottle of what looks just visually to be very strong liquor. 
Leo actually makes a, a little hand signal for, like, go ahead and split that into two, if you please. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so he goes ahead and pours two glasses, and then Eleonora raises an eyebrow. Well, you're the one that took me out on an adventure. It's only polite that I buy the drinks. Fair enough. I was just planning to get myself an ale. This is unexpectedly chivalrous. Bertrand's money. You have as many <laughs> as you like. Fair enough. And she slams it down. Yeah, Leo takes a shot, too. She puts her head on her hand and just kind of looks at you and goes, I find myself wondering if what you said in that meeting was bullshit or not. Oh, it was most assuredly bullshit, but it's bullshit (laughs) I intend to deliver on. And then she tilts her head the other way and goes, show me a magic trick, Duke Valsine. I showed you a magic trick in the meeting. Would you like another one? Yes. Uh, let me look at my spell sheet. I don't have a whole lot prepared! I know. That's not aggro. I would like to cast Spiritual Weapon. Uh, you create a floating spectral weapon within range that lasts for the duration or until you cast the spell again. When you cast the spell, you can make a melee spell attack against a creature within 5 feet of the weapon. On a hit, the target takes force damage equal to 1d8 plus your spell casting ability modifier. Yes. Uh, the weapon takes whatever form you choose. Yes. Um, honestly, I'm just gonna make a... Just a really beautiful, like, curved elven saber. And it's, you know, shimmering and incorporeal. I'm not going to attack anybody with it, and I'm going to do it kind of, like, low down so it doesn't look like I'm pulling out a fucking sword in the middle of the bar. Yeah, I just cast it and kind of nod at it and show it to her. She looks genuinely pretty impressed by it. She goes, huh, can you make anything with that, or is it just that? Leo snaps his fingers, and it changes into a flail. Useful. With, like, skulls on the end of the (laughs) flail. Like, spiky skulls. (laughs) And then he snaps his finger again and changes it into a uh, wickedly curved battle axe. Nice. And then he snaps his fingers again and changes it into a giant beer stein. She laughs, she nods, and she goes, Color me impressed, Duke Valsine. Kimmerl's very generous. Leo Leo said maybe she could pick up on the underlying, like, that son of a bitch under his (laughs) voice, but... Yeah, she snorts and, like, taps at the beer sign with one fingernail and goes, Can this thing do any damage, or is it just for show? Oh, it could do plenty of damage. Uh, I would be reticent to use my powers on a lady of your standing, especially when you've been so kind to me. Um, And, you know, causing a ruckus in a public house seems... A little beneath us, don't you think? Oh, it's most certainly beneath me. But she nods and she says, Well, this has certainly been enlightening. These are the sort of things I'm offering your city-state, princess. This kind of arcane knowledge trade. There are clerics in Australia that can do tenfold what my power has granted me so far. Um. That sort of trade of knowledge could be yours if you convince your father to help me. At that, she looks a little reserved, and she, like, puts her uh, hands in her lap, and she says, My father's not overly impressed with divine magic. He has more than his share of it. Um, can I roll an arcana check to kind of see if I can, like, pick up on what her dad is putting down? Because, I mean, I'm sure that we have, like, paladins in Asturia, but our divine magic is very different, being that it is, like, a death-based domain. Um, oh, shit, that's not bad. That's a 16 to Arcana. Oh, damn. Isaac Ashthorn is a Oath of Devotion paladin. He's pretty jacked up as far as power. Like, he is not tapping into divine magic as directly as you are, certainly. And Well, I mean, I literally yeah, shook hands exactly, with God in exactly. a field, so... <laughs> exactly. But there is, at all times, sort of an aura of it over him. It is of a very different flavor than your own. It seems to be, if you had to make a guess, you would say that the god that holds his divine oath is light or life domain. Okay, so very different from what I've had in the pocket. Yeah, Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's why he doesn't like me. (laughs) Could be. Because you said something about convincing her father and, like, talking to him. She, like, clicks her tongue and sighs and says... My father is set in his ways. His mind is not easily changed. He accepts my counsel better than some others, but 
that's not saying much. Well, it sounds like your father and I are two men of one mind. <laughs> I, Eleanor, may I call you Eleanor? She uh, wiggles the shot glass and says, well, you already bought me a drink, so I suppose so. Eleanor, I think something very crucial that we need to find out about each other and something very crucial that you need to find out about me is that I have become set in my ways and my ways lead me to what I want. And I am going to get what I want, no matter what has to happen to make it come about. Now, that could happen very quickly and very easily with the cooperation of the Council, or I can tart myself around a few more countries and figure out what exactly I have to do to drum myself up an army. I would prefer to not demean myself any farther, given that I left my own country in a wine barrel. <laughs> I, I would like that to be my rock bottom. So, that's out on the table. I would like you to tell me what you think I will have to do to get your father and the others on the council that are unsympathetic to me over to my side. Just as a conversation between friends, let's call it. Roll persuasion check. With advantage. With advantage? Sick. Yeah. Okay. That's a natural 19! Ooh! That's a natural 19 plus 4, 23. Okay. She nods. She says that. My father has little use for political posturing. And even less for what he sees as needless conflict. I think if you want to get him on your side, you will have to prove that you are capable of being a leader of men, and that you are capable, more than that, of forging meaningful connection between our nations. Is that not what I offered today? She leans a little closer and she says, he thinks you're full of shit. Words do not make a leader, Duke Falstein. Action does. What would you have me do? There are very few legions for me to lead on Bertrand's arm at the latest ball of the season. Maybe you should excise yourself from Bertrand's arm. I will not remove myself from the only safety afforded to me outside my country. That's... Suicide. I don't know what my father is planning. I don't know if he sent people after me. I know I am safe in Irie. Why would I leave the one assurance that I have? There comes a time, in my opinion, in all of our lives, that we must choose between achieving our goals or staying stagnant and safe. You are making no headway in the situation by spinning pretty lies or half-truths, we'll say, generously, to the sovereigns of the city-states around us. There are thousands of people in this nation that are not rulers of anything, and they will be the ones to fight for you. As I said, the kings speak with one voice. There are many others. Fair enough, I suppose. Not exactly an approach that I would have imagined. Uh, do I <laughs> look to you, princess, like someone with the makings of a relatable folk hero? It is my opinion that anyone can be a hero if they apply themselves to the task of it. Heroes are not born. I'm a little too busy trying to figure out how to be an archduke to waste too much time trying to be a hero, but I do appreciate your input. <laughs> What time are you wasting with no army, no resources, and no throne, Duke Falstein? Has anyone ever told you you're very mean? Usually they use words like direct. Well, even though you're mean, I'll still buy you another drink, as you did bring me out on this little adventure, and I am going to adjourn back to the bar to get us another round of drinks. Absolutely. As you get up to approach the bar, a hand grabs your shoulder and whirls you around, and you are face-to-face -face with a very large, very muscular human man uh. um, <laughs> who kind of leans in and says, that's a fancy set of robes, isn't it? Uh, is it? Now, sir, it seems that you have quite a bit of money to throw around on, uh, and he like looks over the bar 
And he says, uh, oh, shit, stout woody and whiskey. Damn. Now, it would be quite appreciated if you would throw some of that money around to the less fortunate. And he gestures at himself. Well, while I do appreciate the directness, you're not my type. But, you know, that was very sporting of you. I, I do commend you. Now, if you'll excuse me. You feel the point of a knife in your back. Oh. Just pressing against it. Not stabbing you, but just pressing against it. Leo goes, whoop. <laughs> Roll initiative. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Can't um, the big barbarian guy <laughs> says, I'm robbing you. <laughs> like he thinks you're dumb. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. What an idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, hey, that's a natural 19. 23 to initiative. I'm Ooh, very fast. Okay. Yeah, okay. You are first in the initiative. What are you doing? I am using my last remaining second level spell slot to <laughs> cast another spiritual weapon, because I'm yep. assuming my last one is gone, because it only lasted for yeah. a minute. Yeah. Um, you know, since Eleonora told me that thing about her dad not being, you know, super into violence or conflict or anything, I want to specify that all of the damage I'm doing in this battle is non-lethal. Okay. Um... And when I pull up the second spiritual weapon, it is not the big elven sword that I showed her. Yeah. Because I remember her dad having that thing about, like, his sword being, like, strapped into its scabbard or whatever. Yeah. I- I'm just going to make it, like, a giant gauntleted fist, if I can. <laughs> I'm going to, like, spiritually punch these guys. Fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> um, and then I can punch them with the power of the Lord. I'm going to punch them with the power of our Lord and Savior, Kimrel, and, <laughs> um... I can't actually punch them with the power of our Lord and Savior Kim roll this round because it takes yeah. an action to cast the spell. So I'm just casting the spell. There's a big fist floating in the air and I go, Eleonora! Roll a strength check as this uh, big barbarian guy is going to try to grapple you. That was not really great. That was a 14. That's okay. He rolled a 5. Um, Yay! <laughs> so he tries to grapple you. It doesn't work. And he goes into a rage. <laughs> I duck. <laughs> You, I'm small. I can get out from under his arms. He says, why the... <laughs> and then he looks around, baffled, trying to figure out where you went. He's not smart. I'm like a leaf on the wind. Yeah. And then it's our friend with the knife's turn. You are within five feet of this barbarian, so this rogue is going to get sneak attack. They're not rolling super good, huh? Not Neither of those is going to hit, because it's a ten or a six. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, they have to beat an 18, because Leo's got his shield, yeah, so... Yeah, yeah. So you feel two knives almost slash you? <laughs> I'm a leaf. I, at this point, I am a leaf on the wind. I am dancing yeah, yeah, out of the way yeah, of yeah, the blows. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> um, and then it's Eleanor's turn. She's going to spend her whole action coming over, and she's going to try to attack this rogue. Ooh. She rolled two fives. Ouch. What is wrong with this fight? Um, who's it's next? It's Leo's turn again. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> I Free have, round. I have a plan. Yes, I do. I... I can't <laughs> believe this. I have a plan. Okay, um... Again, I'm trying really hard to get in this old man's good graces. I'm gonna cast Shield of Faith on Eleonora. Okay. So, uh, for the duration, she has a plus two to her AC. Okay. Um, and the duration is ten minutes. It is a concentration spell, however, but a spiritual weapon is not a concentration spell, so it remains active. Okay. Which means I get to decide who to roll an attack on. Actually, no, I'm going to hit the guy that's after Eleonora right now. Okay. Um, so I roll a spell attack on him. The rogue, uh, that's an 18 to hit. Okay, <laughs> that'll do it. Okay, he's going to take... You, like, the fist cocks back about to hit this rogue, and he is not paying attention. He's yelling at the barbarian. He's like... What the fuck, Josh? <laughs> oh my god. Come on. Oh my god, your name is Josh? You tried to manhandle me in the middle of a bar. You are so clearly a closet case, buddy. I am so sorry. You know, and I'm seeing a the lot The barbarian of- yells incoherently. <laughs> no, and I'm seeing where this rage is coming from, and trust me, I've been there. There are people that can help you with this. Um, and I do <laughs> hit the rogue. While I'm distracting him with that, I do yeah. hit the rogue for eight damage with the fist. Ouchie. <laughs> okay, you do eight damage on the rogue. And then it is the barbarian's turn. Yeah, and Eleonora has plus two to her ace. Yes. Barbarian is going to swing on you, so he's going to roll two attacks because he's in a rage. Motherfucker! You can't hit me. I am a leaf on the wind. I have a ten this entire time. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> he misses leaf on both <laughs> his attacks um, and just screams. It's okay, honey. You're not the first person that's worked out their gay panic on me. This is fine, Josh. I'm in this with you. (laughs) 
No, actually, he misses once, and you say that, and he swings again and misses, and says, I'm very comfortable in my sexuality! And from behind you, the halfling says, Yeah, he's very comfortable in his sexuality! <laughs> the rogue's turn, so he yells that, and then two uh, attacks on you. And I haven't moved away, so yeah. Yeah, so he does get a sneak attack. Motherfucker, that one of those is the natural one. So that's okay. The other one's um, gonna hit me though. And yeah, it sure is. It's a twenty. Um, so he's gonna get one d four plus four plus two d six. Yikes! Ten, fourteen damage. Ouch! And then it's Eleanor's turn, and she's gonna roll two attacks on the rogue. <laughs> Not great. <laughs> she rolled a one and a two. Ouch! She's gonna do. She's yeah, got she's an action. Use her well, luck, she's got luck, luck points. points. Yeah. yeah, two luck points to re-roll those. Holy Are shit! You kidding me? Do you want some d20s, man? <laughs> Eleanor does nothing because she can't hit. And then it's Leo's turn again. I love how everybody is just like slapping at each other, and then Leo <laughs> yeah, is like a leaf yeah. on the wind, like dancing between everybody, except for the one time that he does get stabbed. <laughs> <laughs> this is a mess. <laughs> is it back to me? Yes. Uh, has anybody else been hurt? Has Eleanor been hit? No. Nope. Okay. Um, <laughs> Not even a little bit. Uh, so I'm going to do cure wounds on myself then. <laughs> so 1d8 plus 4. So that's 8 hit points that I heal. Yeah, that rogue took me down over half my hit points. Yeah. That was not fun for me. Um, so I do that and then I get a bonus action on that spiritual weapon. Okay. I'm going to hit the rogue again because he's a nasty little bastard man that stabbed <laughs> okay. me. That's only a 10 to hit with a spiritual yeah, weapon. It's so yeah, it's not going to hit him. Okay. Um... Yeah, so I, I heal myself, and then I try to punch him, and I, it doesn't work. Okay. The barbarian from behind you <laughs> yells, Actually, when you think about it, mocking someone for being a closet case is really in poor taste. And he swings on you twice. So he's going to hit you with one of those. Ouch. Ten. Ouch. Um, right before the axe hits him, Leo goes, Actually, that's very valid. Thank you for calling me out. Ouch! <laughs> <laughs> I came from a very repressed background. I'm trying to unlearn a lot of things. Oh, God, there's so much blood. <laughs> The rogue from behind you <laughs> is going to swing on Eleanor and yell, You know, when you think of it, we all have harmful attitudes to unlearn, but we should be held accountable. <laughs> 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 oh, he hit Eleanor both times. Ooh. Actually, he's going to hit each of you once. Uh, he hits Eleanor for six damage. Six damage for Eleanor, and then he's got you on the other attack, and that's going to be with sneak attack damage. Both. Think of that damage. Ouch. Uh, Leo's unconscious. Great. <laughs> if he was last in the order, right? Am I making death saves? He was not last in the order. Eleanor is going to take her turn and swing on this motherfucker <laughs> for 12 and a 24. A 24 will do it. Yes, it will. Five damage to the rogue. And then I'm going to roll something real quick. Okay, so Leo, you go unconscious. As you go unconscious, you see a vision of Kimrel. <laughs> Oh no. With his his great black robes and his big horned skeleton head. Is this like the first time in five years that we've hung out? Probably not. Probably you've seen visions of him before. Okay. But <laughs> This isn't how I thought this was gonna go, just for the record, so if you wanna like save me <laughs> He just like puts one skeleton hand on his head and says To, to, to be fair, I wasn't. I didn't know that this was going <laughs> to happen. They they were not sportsmen like I was set upon <laughs> from behind. Listen, I would really like to not die. I have a lot of things on my agenda that I need to accomplish before that happens. So if there's like any strings you could pull, Kimrel opens his mouth and you are shocked back to consciousness. <laughs> A, a figure is looming over you, like, pushing bandages into the big stab that the rogue did on you. Oh, great. <laughs> Just, this is a big, beefy, half-orc dude, long hair back in a ponytail, big, like, gold ornaments out of his tusks. Are you an angel? He laughs, very obviously drunkenly, <laughs> and he says, Not quite, little buddy, <laughs> and he pats you up on the cheek, and then he gets up and he swings on the rogue. <laughs> Okay, so the medicine check, uh, just let me check in. Um, is that going to restore me to one hit point? Yes. Okay. Okay, okay. so you're back up with one hit point, and this, this big dude is going to swing on the rogue. That's a 24. <laughs> Get him! 
So he's got to do 1d4 plus 3 damage on the rogue. Ba, ba, ba. Six. Decent. He, like, wobbles a little bit as he rears his fist back, and then he slurs, I'm really glad that we're having this open and honest conversation on intercommunity issues, and then wham! <laughs> <laughs> Punches the rogue super hard. Then that's going to be Leo's turn. <laughs> I have a channel divinity that I would like yeah, to yeah, use. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to use my, um, well, I'm going to see if I can hit this guy first. Okay, I'm going to try to hit him with an unarmed strike. Just just slap him. 19. <laughs> yeah, that's going to hit. I'm going to hit him, and that is going to be, uh, since I don't have proficiency in unarmed strikes, three bludgeoning damage, but I can also use my channel divinity, which is touch of death, which allows me to add 11 necrotic damage onto any melee Oof. attack. So I punch Oof. him, but with death. Okay. And right before I <laughs> slap him, actually, yeah. I think it's like an open hand slap. Yeah. Leo agrees with the dude that just like brought him back and resuscitated him. Yeah. And goes, yeah, no, I think it's really important that within the debating field of queer theory that we really accept intersectionality and everything that it implies. And then he slaps. <laughs> <laughs> him for 14, for 14 damage. Damage. Okay. and it's necrotic too so he doesn't get to half it he's gonna get that 11 and then he does half that bludgeoning damage in the honor strike okay so then it would be 12 uh, yeah so i hit him and then i also get the bonus action from my spiritual weapon oh that's right which yeah. is not concentration so me going unconscious would not have dispelled it okay so i'm gonna roll to hit on the rogue but that was a 19 so okay uh, yeah, you're all under a 1d8 plus 4, 12. Ooh. Okay. 12 force damage from the giant gauntleted fist. The rogue is unconscious. <laughs> Goodbye. You have knocked him out. Um, I have barbarian, not, though. <laughs> I have not pulled out my sword this entire time. Yes. Let the record show. <laughs> yes. The barbarian watches he smack his friend unconscious. <laughs> and then... He just kind of nods and says, that's fair, we should really be taking, like, a broad view of all of these issues, and we need to be hearing other viewpoints, and whack! <laughs> he rolled a 23 to hit. So, that's gonna do it. And he does 11 damage. To me? Who does he think is the, this is the strongest threat? I mean, Leo is bleeding out of every orifice yeah. right now, so probably not him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Zed hasn't taken any damage, so he's gonna do 10 <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna do eleven damage to Zed, um, and the rogue is unconscious. Eleonora is gonna swing on the barbarian. Uh, she gets two attacks. Oh, that's a crit! I love those dice, man. Yeah, get okay. it. <laughs> so she hit him twice, once with a crit, and that means she's gonna do three d four plus yeah three d four damage plus six. Seventeen damage. Get him. Got him. He's still not fucking unconscious. As Eleanor stabs him, she's gonna yell, I mean, you're all right. I really do think we as the queer community need to have better conversations about this, but I don't know why we're talking about it during a bar brawl. And she smacks him real hard. And then the guy that just entered the fray says, you know what, that's a really good point. And then is gonna... <laughs> oh, Get him. Get him. Okay. Get him. Get him. Get him. That's the second nat 20 from that d20 I just loaned them. Yes. <laughs> I love those dice. Yeah. So he rolled a D Olga nat 20 on his first attack, and then he's going to spend a key point to do for a lurry of blows. Kill him. Well, don't kill him. That's don't the whole kill point. Him. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think Leo yells, please don't kill him. I'm yeah. trying to make a political point. <laughs> so he makes two more unarmed strikes. Uh, he hits with one of them. You distracted him. I've been told that I do that. God. Uh, so that's 3d4 again, plus 6. Holy shit. 16 damage. Good night, sweet prince. <laughs> uh, he, like, slurs as he wobbles. That's a really good point. We need to save this conversation for a civil forum. And then he, wham, <laughs> just smacks this dude super hard in the back of the head and the barbarian goes down. Okay, uh, are we out of initiative? Yes. Is that everybody that yes. was in initiative? Yes. <laughs> I would like to cast Cure Wounds on myself because I yeah. have one hit point. Yeah. 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 Yeah, Leo is just bleeding out of every fucking orifice. Yeah. Um, I get seven, seven hit points back. Okay. And then, in turn, I would also like to cast Cure Wounds on Eleonora yes. and <laughs> on our savior. Yeah. <laughs> using all of my spell slots. I have no more left, so I really hope nothing else is going to happen today. So <laughs> Eleonora gets ten hit points back, and our new friend uh, is getting... 
12 hit points back. <laughs> nice. And Leo just, like, patches everybody up to the best of his clerical ability and just He's goes, Can we go? <laughs> They're both back up to full, by the way. <laughs> Leo is still fine. very bloody. <laughs> Leo, like, patched himself up the best he could. They're both fine. Leo looks like he got the shit beat. Well, Leo did get the shit beaten out of it. Yeah. <laughs> Eleonora, fully healed, brushes her dress off <laughs> and says, Actually, I need to I need to go in a big way. <laughs> I am so late. And then she's going to, like, pat you on the shoulder gingerly. <laughs> And then run. She's out. Behind her, Leo goes, did you see? Did you see how I dealt with them? My sword never left its scabbard. <laughs> she doesn't I, acknowledge that. I punched down. them into submission. <laughs> Eleonora. <laughs> Eleonora. And then your new friend turns to you and holds out a hand. And he's like swaying where he stands. And he says, Zed Stone Bloom, at your service. Are you? Metaphorically. Because of Australian culture stuff, is Leo used to shaking hands? I mean, well, he's been here for five years. Yeah, well, I don't know if you shake a lot of hands. I don't know if you meet a lot of people. I think Leo looks down at the hand, frowns at it, and bows, like a short little bow, and okay. goes, Leiril Valsign, Grand Duke of Australia, um, and I suppose I'm quite literally at yours, given that you did save my life. Yeah, he, like, laughs super hard and <laughs> laughs his knee. I get that a lot. That you saved somebody's life? Yes. Okay. And then he gestures at the unconscious barbarian and rogue, and he says, been tracking those chuckleheads for three days. So really, all part of the job description. Uh, Leo, I think, sits down <laughs> at the nearest table because he's not very stable on his feet right now. Because yeah, yeah, he's yeah. gotten the fuck beat out of him. <laughs> and uh, just kind of perches his chin in his hand and goes... Yeah, what, what, what's what's your job, if you don't mind me asking? He grins super broadly, uh, again, with those, like, jewelry-encrusted tusks. Okay. And he says, I am a former monk of the Order of the Golden Tusk, and current a bounty hunter. And you are? Uh, the, the Grand Duke of Australia, I just said. Ah, yeah. Perhaps you've heard of me and my exploits and my my cause. You know, um, <laughs> I have the room in the budget for a bounty hunter. If you maybe would want to um, work something out, I think that, you know, an archduke would pay much better than your uh, typical run-of-the-mill clientele. Zed, may I call you Zed? <laughs> He sits down at the table, and his posture changes, straightens up, and gets a lot more serious. And he says, If you're paying, you can call me anything you like. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> no. And that's where we end for the night. That's it. <laughs> okay. Oh, boy, howdy. That was a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, yeah, wow, we will see you guys on our next session. Um, we are going back to Australia next session, to where Ferrora is dealing with some challenges, probably less violent than this, however, of her own. And, yeah, we will see you next time. On Compelled Duel! <laughs>
just two dollars a month, you'll get access to episodes 24 hours before they're supposed to release on all of the other streaming platforms. And in addition, you'll also get access to the patron channel on our official Discord, which you can find in links on our Twitter and our Tumblr. At $3 a month, you'll get access to our patron tier of our official Spotify playlists. So that includes things like kind of like fun joke playlists, non-official shit playlists, stuff like that. And at $5 a month, you'll get a handwritten wax sealed letter from a compelled dual character of your choice every month. So please consider pledging to us on Patreon. It will help us a lot in terms of improving our recording space and some other stuff like that. If you're enjoying anything that you've heard thus far, we would love to see what you've got to say in our social media hashtags. We're tracking both hashtag compelled duel and hashtag compelled duel pod. A special thank you to our VIP tier patrons, the Heart Road and Peculiar Wizard, for pledging $5 a month. The next episode will be releasing on December 11th, 2020, so two weeks from now. And yeah, we'll see you then. Hope to see some of you guys in the Discord and. We really hope you guys are enjoying what you're hearing so far.